Hey everyone, this is Bertrand Sperling from Best Places, and we're coming to you with an exciting episode for our podcast this week. We have a guest, um, Amy Cutlip, who is a data journalist and a Twitch streamer, and she's done our new study, the top 10 most rent burdened zip codes. So we're going to be asking her some questions about that study and also having her go over the methodology and the process she went to get this study to us. So welcome, Amy. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Great to have you. Great. Hi, Amy. Hi. Okay. So let's jump into this story. Um, what, what, what's the story about and what made you decide to do it? The story is the top 10 most rent burdened zip codes in the United States. And what really drove me to want to do this study is to look at the underpinnings of our markets, especially our rental housing markets that are really driving inequality for renters who are paying the ultimate premium, depending on where they live, especially if they are considered low income renters and pointing out some underlying factors, maybe tied to socioeconomic status, maybe local policies that are exacerbating rent burdened households in these particular areas great so let's let's yeah let's uh address the title what what does rent burden mean and cost burden mean what are the definitions thereof the definition of cost burden according to hud the department of housing and urban development is paying more than 30 percent of your income on housing so rent burden would be specifically tied to how much of your income is going toward rent. You have you have rent burden or cost burdened, which is paying 30% or more. And then you have severely cost burdened and rent burden status, which is paying 50% of, or more on your income. So the study that we focused on and the top 10 most rent burden zip codes are well above severe rent burden status. I believe the the number 10 most rent burden zip code is 70% of income going toward rents. And this is of course a collective calculation where my methodology was to look at the aggregate or median household income for the entire zip code and the median gross rent or cash that is paid on a monthly basis. So that is the way that I calculated rent burden by taking the gross median rents as a percentage of median household income for renters specifically. Great. Yeah, I was definitely in the cost burden um, when I was in LA. And I think when I first started out in the mailroom at uh, Endeavor, which is now WME, but when I was in the mailroom, I was definitely in the in the 50% too. Half of my rent went to, so that's severely, severely cost yes. burden too. Is this a, is this study a good opportunity for developers who are looking to create more housing out there? I mean, just throwing it out right away. I think it's hard to defend the Gimbyist position, which is yes, in my backyard, it tends to be a policy prescription that a lot of developers are very interested in. But the way that I see things, knowing what I know about real estate development and market fundamentalism. There is actually no way that you can build more housing that will somehow alleviate the overall cost of rent, the cost to acquire land and the cost to build, especially in Los Angeles, is so astronomically high that the amount of rent that will be charged outright will probably be a little above the fair market rate in the existing area. So there's actually no way to build yourself out of the affordability crisis, mm. especially in places like Los Angeles, where the cost to build one unit is around $500,000. So we're talking about half a million dollars just to build one housing unit. So because of these factors, the cost of materials, the cost to acquire land, the cost for construction, for subcontractors, labor, it makes it almost impossible to build more housing and achieve some sort of market-based equilibrium that would overall drive down the cost of rents. Wow. So, so Amy, I think this is really important. What you just said was contradictory to so much of what we've been hearing, which right. is, oh, we have to build more units. We have to build our way out of it. We have to make, we have to just keep building to make everything more affordable. And you're saying that's not going to be the answer. 
that's not going to be the answer. And look no further than the fact that we have 17.5 million vacant units in this country. Now, vacancies can be uh, empty dwellings that are on the market, or they could be uh, dilapidated buildings that maybe don't pass uh, health or code uh, or safety code inspections. Uh, it just depends on where you are. But we know that in most places, there are a fair number of vacant units because people cannot afford to pay whatever the fair market price is that is offered. Mm -hmm. And that's actually preferred by economists to leave enough room for those who might be transplanted into the city, into high payer, higher paid positions so that they have a place where they can live. It really falls down on the uh, lower income renters who are kind of always at risk for displacement by way of being pushed out of their own communities because if there is an opportunity to take a lower income, maybe underdeveloped part of town and start to go through the process of redevelopment or uh, to to be honest about what this is, gentrification, then those who are kind of on the cusp of displacement anyway, if they're paying a significant amount of their income on rent or do fall under the category of cost burdened or rent burdened status, then they don't have a lot of say in what they can do because they are renters. They don't have any stake to the land itself or their homes and uh, what ends up happening is there's a, a push to bring in a, a new wave of people or a new cohort of people, especially in these up and coming uh, areas that are, you know, speculated to see a, a population increase in the next 10 or so years. And so speculation plays a huge role here. But until we, you know, we address the income inequality factor, it can be really difficult to even use this market-based logic to build more housing when the cost that will be automatically set is well above what your median household income will allow those who fall on the other side of that, you know, the 50% of, of, of the other side of the median household income or the area median uh, income to afford. So that's where we have this disconnect. Those who are not living comfortably or suffering from a high cost of living, you know, anyone who was not reaching that AMI and maybe is at 80% AMI or all the way down to 30% AMI, that means that they are obviously in a much more precarious position and we don't have enough subsidies that are available or affordable housing units that are designated for those who are making less money than what the area median income offers. And that only further strengthens this argument against building uh, new housing units for the purposes of trying to uh, you know, alleviate this, this affordability crisis. So to, so, to, so to translate what you're saying is that the homelessness issue is not a drug issue. It's not a, a, this is my choice type of issue. This is more of a, an economic issue based on what's going on within our own economy. Right. And um, what we're seeing now is the way that market fundamentalism plays a huge role in our real estate economy is that landlords, whether they be corporate landlords or small mom and pop landlords, they will find any excuse to raise rents that match the overall market in a given area. So if there is you know, uh, an area where there's naturally affordable housing, meaning that maybe it's not in the best part of town, maybe it's a little older building, outdated amenities, that is typically how the cost of rent is lower than the fair market rents in a more developed area. But landlords are still taking this opportunity, kind of piggybacking off of redevelopment and a, uh, a uh, saturated market where the higher demand is, is justified to raise rents as well. In areas such as uh, San Francisco, you see this. It's, uh, it's becoming more uh, about 
seeing the demand to live in a given area if there is a lot of economic development and by way of having a lot of people interested in living in a particular market that does raise the cost of rent regardless of the conditions of the housing units themselves. So people will pe- some renters will be paying a very high price for the bare minimum and maybe even substandard conditions. And especially when it comes to lower wage em- employees that are working in the local economy and maybe not making the same amount as somebody who is in a higher wage position, they are the ones who are most at risk for homelessness. And in Los Angeles, there's actually a pretty high percentage of people who are experiencing homelessness because they were priced out of their own neighborhoods, but they live in their cars. They are still attempting to remain, you know, productive members of society. They are going to work, but they simply cannot afford to live where they live based on their own income that they're making. So Mm -hmm. that's one of the most, uh, I think, misunderstood factors in some areas like Los Angeles, that people are experiencing homelessness, but it's not because they have given up on life. They don't want to just live in destitution. They are still working. They just can't afford to live where they work. Uh, So Amy, uh, before we get into your study and take a look at that, which I'm looking forward to, what's your backstory and where can people find your work and hear more about what you're doing? I am a Twitch streamer and, uh, you know, say what you will about Twitch streaming, but it's a really good opportunity to have open discussions about things that matter the most to me, which is housing uh, related issues, policies. And well, what's, what's Twitch, by the way? What's Twitch? <laughs> Twitch. By the, so, so, some people won't even know what Twitch it's is. True, true. Uh, so Twitch is a live streaming platform that is usually the place for, to watch uh, gamers. It's a video game streaming platform that's kind of been taken over by a small pool of online leftists, so to speak. And so I, uh, I, I do launch my my show onto Twitch, and I'm usually in the just chatting section. And um, I have open conversations with anyone who comes into my chat. And I also have a little bit of programming that I do where I uh, go over housing news. It's where I do my live data visualizations and I'll do data analysis kind of with my audience to to look at some interesting findings that are usually tied to housing related issues or market related issues in the in in housing specifically. Interesting. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. I'm also uh, I'm also a, a graduate from West Virginia University. I have a political science degree as well as a master's in uh, community and regional planning. So that's kind of what my background led me to when when I you know, started to become incredibly interested in housing related issues and housing injustice and homelessness. Hmm. Really getting the information out in certainly a, a new way that uh, <laughs> probably your professors never envisioned. Probably not. <laughs> Yeah, what Probably what led not. you to what led you to Twitch um, as opposed to maybe like a you could do live you could do YouTube live streaming if you want to do you could. I'm honestly not sure how I ended up staying on Twitch. I know what originally led me to Twitch, but I never envisioned myself to be a streamer. I always thought that it would be fun to talk about politics, and I would I, I argue with people uh, online. I had argued with people online about politics for free. And uh, taking the opportunity to uh, have the platform that I have to talk about the things that matter to me was intriguing. And um, I don't know why it ended up being Twitch instead of any other live streaming platform, because I didn't really ever see myself as a live streamer. I kind of always imagined that I would go into something that would end up uh, becoming a focal point for housing related uh, policies and looking to become a policy analyst and an organizer that would help me uh, kind of achieve those goals of of knowing how best to um, act as a consultant for uh, local residents who are maybe going through issues tied to gentrification or NIMBYism, which stands for not in my backyard, fighting for uh, their rights to preserve their, their neighborhoods that might be at risk for development or uh, opportunity zones that were introduced during the Trump administration. And uh, I guess I, I kind of leaned into this idea of online educational uh, incapacity, capacity building, excuse me, that uh, 
kind of made it possible to reach a broader audience and still work at the local level to organize, to kind of get that 360 degree experience where Mm -hmm. you can share what you know with as many people online and continue to do the work that you want to do within your community. And that flexibility that Twitch offers is something that I also was, you know, really interested in. Yeah. Yeah, I <clears throat> I came across your stream and and clicked in and watched it because of the title, which was so it probably had something to do with data visualizations or real estate and real estate. I thought that was so it st- it stood out so much amongst the uh, the uh, hot tub streams and the Call of Duty streams that I was like, well, th- that's kind of exactly what, what I do every day on my uh, you know for my work. That's crazy that someone would be on Twitch talking about this stuff and. It wasn't just a scam. It, like you spend hours almost every day talking with people, and you take your audience along on a interesting ride down <laughs> some issues that they probably even never considered, and uh, certainly a courageous thing to do. I would I would say on on Twitch, which is a can be a lot of frivolity on Twitch. I'd say overall, which is fine, which is what what it's kind of there for, but. Indeed, I would. I wouldn't say that it is the most uh, interesting thing for people who are kind of bouncing around on Twitch to come across. It has uh, a very unique. Uh, it has a very unique feel to it. Whenever you do come into my stream during a data visualization uh, segment, and I've heard positive and, and negative uh, feedback about what an audience can really learn if they are not familiar with the process of data visualization. And I tend to use uh, Tableau, a BI software program that, you know, I still am I'm learning to maneuver around. So I think some people find it to be a little uh, boring, if you will, because they don't necessarily know what's going on because they're not familiar with uh analyzing and visualizing data and some people who have stuck around they have uh they have come to really enjoy the data visualization streams because they have they have enough experience of what i'm doing and they they kind of have been able to follow along to the point where they kind of have a better understanding of what the data is and how i'm working to visualize the data from like the process of of collecting the data, mining it, cleaning it in Excel, moving it to a Tableau, and yeah. then building those data dashboards. That can be, I guess, an intriguing process if you <laughs> kind of can follow along with it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Quick question. Edward Tufte, are you familiar with him? I'm not. Okay. Uh, he's been called the Da Vinci of data and very sort of a seminal figure in data visualization. Anyway, he's been revered by some, and I was wondering if you had an opinion. Um, some people worship him. Frankly, I think <laughs> big, big minus. Well, yeah, him. well, he, he's he's known for a, one particular vis- visualization that he did, which I think it was, what, Napoleon's March? Yep. Uh, east, eastward? Eastward into Russia, kind of. And it, anyway, it's... It's it's famous because, and you can peep, a lot of people have it on their walls, like a lot of nerdy academics have it on their walls or whatever. Um, he basically stuffed everything he could, as far as data points, into that visualization, and it was hailed as probably like twenty years ago, I think, right? Um, anyway, it was hailed as like this amazing bit of data viz because as as Napoleon, so it starts on the left, and Napoleon marches into Russia. Um, and that was, I think, the that was what killed um, Napoleon, um, or that's he failed that uh, during that march eastward into the cold Russian winter, and that's where he says an arm. That's where Napoleon said an, ar- an army marches on its stomach. He ran out of canned food, I think, actually, um, over there. He ran out of food, but anyway. So as it goes from Europe to into Russia, he's adding in all these different data points and. It's it's interesting to look at, just to, to to look at it as a history of data viz type stuff. Yeah, actually, Bertrand, that was done by a fellow named Menard way back. Oh, when. Pierre, oh, Pierre Menard, yeah, okay. That's and right. uh, he includes things like time and location, temperature, geography, historical context into one graphic. Tufty thinks this is the most amazing figure okay. ever because you can look at it for almost an hour and c- still get information. Mm-hmm. 
I think the reality is that people <laughs> want to look at a graphic and get one piece of information if they're lucky, and then they move on to the next graphic. They don't have time to unpack the entire thing. But anyway, tough I think it's like an internet, an internet type thing. Like uh, on the internet, you want to give people their info quickly, or else they're going to click on something. Whereas if you have this Pierre Menard po uh, print on your wall at a cocktail party, you can s stand around and look at it for 20 minutes and be like, oh, this is really interesting. So it's kind of a different delivery format. Yeah. So Amy, where could we find you on Twitch? Because literally there, there are hundreds of people, <laughs> well, actually hundreds <laughs> of millions of people maybe on Twitch. Uh, what's are. your tag or whatever? My handle is Amy C3, A-M-Y-E C3. And that's also my handle for Twitter and my Substack. Great. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are we ready, Bertrand, to take do a deep dive into Amy's work? I think we are. All right. So this is the study that... I worked on with Bertrand to calculate the top 10 most rent burden zip codes in the United States. I started off by giving a definition of cost burden that is defined by the Department of Housing and Urban Development to kind of set a precedent to uh, better understand what it means to be rent burdened. And as we discussed earlier, renters who are paying 30% or more of their income on housing are considered cost burden or rent burden. And anyone or renters who are paying 50% or more of their income on housing are considered extremely cost burdened. So all of the top 10 zip codes meet this criteria of severely cost burdened. Starting with number one, this was quite jarring to, to see these results, but our number one most rent burden zip code is 78705. This is in Austin, Texas, right outside of uh, the University of Austin, or excuse me, the University of Texas at Austin's main campus. It is primarily made up of renters. There's only a small percentage of owners. Something that is very common in these bigger metropolitan areas is a larger group of renters paying 35% or more on their income. And this is very much on par with this particular zip code that happens to be the most rent burdened. You'll see that because renters are the, the main demographic here in the, in the zip code, most of them are you know, falling on this uh, spectrum of, of uh, annual income that, that ranges. But up at the very top, this is where the very small percentage of owners kind of make up that share of population breakdown based on these income brackets. And so the, the vast majority of owners who are in this area are making somewhere between $100,000 or more. So this is indicative of a wide wealth gap or a, a disparity in income, if you will. Evidenced by this graph over here, which I think this is probably one of the more interesting graphs that kind of breaks down the amount of income and the amount of rents that are charged for either a, a renter or an owner. And, and basically, I started at the zero, uh, zero axis and then worked my way out to determine the owner's and renter's median household income and their household costs. And what this is intended to evidence is the amount of money that owners are making compared to renters. And then coupling this information with the amount of money that owners are paying in mm. monthly housing costs compared to renters. So as you can see, owners are absolutely paying a, a little more in their monthly housing costs compared to renters, but they're also making much more in comparison. So the distance mm. between the zero axis, when looking at this bottom graph with owners and renters, you can see uh, they're, ki they're kind of uh, moving further away from the zero. Right. So um, the, the owners are making, seven, looks like $7,600 
uh, a month, and then but they're only paying about two thousand dollars in their um, mortgage, I guess. And then, mm -hmm. but then if you look at how close on the other side of those two graphs, you have there's our ninety eight percent figure where the average renter's paying twelve sixty eight, but then they're making uh, twelve seventy three. So. Amy, do you have any uh, racial and ethnic background? Because uh, I know from our visits uh, in um, uh, in Austin that the area uh, east and uh, a little south of uh, the campus are predominantly um, minority owned or minority, a lot of, uh, and they probably rent there. Of course, they don't own their own homes, but um is that a, a case of gentrification? Do they still live there? Or I guess with this kind of income, they, they, must, uh, they must have been sort of gentrified out of there. I would, I would suggest that this could be an area that has gone through some iteration of a gentrification while the university or the campus was kind of expanding. There might have been... An, and in, in, uh, an interest for developers to bring in more housing that would be designated for college uh, kids who are going to school at the University of Texas, but not living on campus. And I would say in this instance, because Austin has been going through a major population change and economic development that has brought in a lot of different people. We can't necessarily indicate whether or not there is some evidence of, of gentrification that is disproportionately impacting a marginalized community because it looks like the vast majority of residents uh, are whites at 78 per, or 76% or so. And then the next closest uh, population is Asians with uh, a 13% uh, population presence. So what, I, what I, would, I would consider this to be more so an indication that college campuses are only providing around 45% of their college students with housing options either on campus or off campus that are designated housing units that are subsidized. So the, the onus really falls onto those uh, second, third, fourth year college students who maybe don't want to live on campus. They want to live off campus, but because there are not a lot of options that is uh, provided through the university, they have to enter the private market and pay whatever the fair market rate is. And if the cost is much higher in these areas that are right outside of the uh, campus boundary, then renters who are going to school might not have much say because they're kind of anchored to this specific location and they have to pay whatever the cost is in order to, uh, in order to be able to get to campus and classes on time. So I would say that more than anything else is maybe the driver that is uh, causing this significant rent burden. Yeah, uh, Amy, a couple of things. Uh, thanks for pointing that out, uh, the, the chart that you have or the table. Well, can you where, zoom in a little bit? On okay. Um, so let's see, the, you, you have the uh, total population by race up there, and we see that overwhelmingly uh, it's white alone. Uh, so this whole thought that I had about uh, being minority owned, uh, the areas around town. Now you remember going to the barbecue place, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this was back about how many years ago? 15 years ago that we oh, were down in? Yeah, so long ago. Yeah. Yeah, but, so long. And, and anyway, a, that was a totally uh, different that, place back then, you oh, know, than it is now. Totally. Um, so it's mainly white. And then we look at the uh, age cohorts that we have, totally, uh, almost all of it uh, is uh, 15 to 34 year olds. Yeah. And 65 uh, plus is very, very small. Uh, also very small, the 35 to 64. So basically that tells me that these are all young people, uh, fairly uh, well-to-do, at least the ones that own their homes and they're uh, mostly white. So I think that certainly tells a story. Absolutely. Yeah, Amy, I, I was wondering if you would be able to um, click on the link 
that Nick just sent so we could see uh, a visual of this zip code. Um, it's something that we just put up on best places recently. And, and Nick, you, you can, sp- I, I'm taking Nick's thunder cause he's the map guy, but <laughs> no, no um, problem at all. Um, would you be willing to click on that link? I will as soon as I find it because it's in the chat. If you hit, if you hit chat. the chat button at the bottom in the bottom middle of your main Zoom screen, uh, there's a chat thingy, chat button. And by the way, I can it, don't worry about. It, I can edit all these little technical these little times when we're figuring out technical stuff. I can just edit these out. So yeah. If, so if you take your mouse all the way down to the bottom of the screen you'll see a black bar that pops up and right in the middle, there's something called chat. And if you click on that chat, then you'll see the link. Um, okay. Perfect. Cool. Awesome. Really? Oh yeah. Look at that. Zooming. Yeah, there we go. Awesome. That's exactly what we're. Oh yeah. Is it? Now, yeah. Nick has created yeah. all of this. He's, he's like yep. a mastermind. So the campus is to the right, right? Yeah. So, yeah, you'll see in the... Southeast, southeast. You see the football stadium down there. Right. Mm-hmm. You said the campus is kind of like carved out of this zip code. It makes it look like a very obscure shape, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's not included in the zip code at all. And that is the that is considered the UT campus. Yep. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So, if you if you look at kind of the built environment of this particular zip code, you can see that there's a lot of variety, but the area to the left of what is the UT campus, it looks to be primarily made up of bigger buildings, suggesting these are where the multifamily housing units or the apartment complexes are. And then if you kind of move out, into the you know the northern perimeter of the uh, zip code, you start to see a, a different kind of of de- of design or developments, which looks like that would be the area, especially in the. Uh, let me see, do we have a pointer? In this area over here, in particular, and up here, this looks to be more so suburban-like single-family dwelling units, and I would I would uh, assume that this is where those owners live that small percentage of owners live in the in the zip code mm-hmm. in these areas around the the outer perimeter interesting yeah one of the big the only the, the, I, I got like some uh negative emails uh from our from our uh oh from our mailchimp our mailing list people was you i mean you don't you don't hear people don't People rarely contact you to tell you that you're doing a great job. They only, <laughs> you get the negative stuff. But um, people were like, 98% of uh, their income on rent, that's ridiculous. You're an idiot. Um, so well, that's why yeah. I made it abundantly clear in this uh, portion up here, because there's no way anyone would be able to survive paying 90%, uh, 98% of their income on rents. And I actually wanted to add this in the supplemental. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, literature. Uh, if, if you scroll all the way down, Amy, we included that um, on, on the best places site. So um, uh, it's all the way down. Uh, and you did address that. And I remember you and I talking about this, Amy, early in the I process. I put it in bold, even. Yeah. I put this in bold because I knew that people would automatically call this into question. Yeah, well, right there, there is one one notable. Yeah, it's, it says no. It, you're up a little up. Yeah, one okay. notable caveat. Yeah, students, especially those taking classes full time, typically use parental support loans or savings to pay rent instead of income. So I would say this absolutely applies to the zip yeah. code in Austin. Yeah, and, and along, so we had. Oh, go go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say along those lines. Um, this has kind of got the gears in my head turning about those who are renters who have a high portion of their income spent on rent, but i um, curious about the breakdown of renters that are roommates. Uh, that would be a really interesting thing to see because, you know, again, the, if your income is 
1200 bucks and your rent's roughly 1200 bucks, but you're split three ways or whatever it is, then that can change things as well. I was curious to see if you had, had considered, you know, the effects of splitting that amongst multiple students, or is that, is that a factor here, you think? I, I would be interested to know how that does play a role in the breakdown of how much rent is charged in areas that might have two, three, four bedrooms, mm-hmm. right? That breakdown of the, the median rent, but it's not necessarily controlled for in this particular study. It's just kind of looking at the high level or whatever the median rental income is, as well mm-hmm. as the, the gross rent that is paid. Cool. That, that's a really good point, Nick. Thank you for mentioning that. I know that when I was a student at my university, uh, there was six of us in an apartment and we were paying 300 each. So, I mean, it seems really high, but at the end of the day, you know, just as an individual, it's not too bad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Also, the, uh, we've, I've seen some studies where they have looked at the amount that people pay for some people making less than $20,000 a year and one's making twenty to 40000 and so on, and then people make more than $200,000 a year. And the portion that they pay for rent, you're right, it is huge. And it is like 98% of their income. And the very poor people are getting subsidies through food stamps. Uh, they're getting um, maybe some tax uh, abatement or uh, different government programs that allow them at least temporarily uh, mm-hmm. to survive. So actually they're in a deficit spending thing. So yes, they could, they could spend 98%. They could actually be losing money every year, but they're able to hang on and survive and claw their way through life through various uh, subsidies. And right, some people yeah. will say, is that good or bad? But it does enable people to survive on very little. Right. Yeah, if you're like, if you're right on that knife edge, like two or three hundred bucks in food stamps a month can make a big difference. And there are anecdotal stories online of people doing that, and and they have these kind of background stories of people, and it shows what they spend or how they make, you know, seventy five dollars for food for a family last all week. And so there are a lot of people that are are living like that. Yeah. Um. So Amy. So. We, we made a decision, you and I, on this project early on to, inc- we, we identified uh, the, this co- kind of college town phenomenon with these rent burdened cities early on in the process. And we decided to leave them in. And there are a, there are a few uh, college towns, but not all of them, right, are, are college towns. So can we talk about some of the zip codes that don't have necessarily anything to do with the college and look at a case study uh, in that category? Sure. So over half of the most rent burden zip codes are in college towns. Six out of 10 are, but if we go to one that is not, we have number three most written burden zip code. This is 60464. This is right outside of Chicago. It is part of Cook County and Chicago's metropolitan area. It's in a very quaint neighborhood, Palos Park. And I would say this is one of the more interesting uh, case studies that have a lot to do with political ramifications that apply to local land use decisions that usually are inherently violent in nature for those who are not meeting the classical description of your demographic that makes up the vast majority of a population. As you'll see, there's a lot of variety too in the age cohort because this particular area is known as a suburban enclave for high earners who are doing quite well. These neighborhoods, if you take a look at what these these houses look like they look like they're castles they are huge and they are Mm. on you know acre plots of land and there was interest to bring in new developments that would diversify not just the zip code itself but the housing stock that's available because right now 
pretty much the only housing that is available are these single family dwellings on these huge lots of land. And the residents actually have been pretty vocal in participating in the local land use decision making process and going to those uh, city council meetings or neighborhood meetings and opposing any new development because they like the aesthetics of their single family dwelling units. And this is very on par with NIMBYism, where existing residents, because they are the constituents and local uh officials tend to favor the, the, the wishes or the desires or the uh, preferences of existing residents, they weigh those decisions much more heavily than any advocacy that might be pushing to bring in a new cohort or a, a new slate of individuals into this uh, particular area. And so one of the issues as well is an aging population that is experiencing rent burden. So it's the exact opposite of our college campuses where we have a, a, we have large swaths of younger people who are living on the edge of poverty or maybe experiencing poverty because they're in college and, and they don't have a job or maybe they're working a low wage position uh, 20 hours a week. But on the opposite side of this uh, spectrum is this particular zip code where it's actually the elderly population that are struggling right now to be able to pay to uh, live in the areas where they are renting, which again is, is very small in comparison to the owners. It looks like owners outweigh renters 8,725 8, to 896. So with the very small hmm. percentage of renters in this area, a lot of them are you know, that's, that's pretty interesting. That's a exact opposite of what we saw as far yeah. as the other zip code, which was oh, these are this is a zip code primarily of renters. Very and the people that are can afford to own is a very small amount. And then here we're seeing, you know, ninety to ten, you know, only ten percent. About that's not quite right, but uh, whatever. Um, yeah, it's about eleven percent um, of people are renters, which is very low. So it's kind of a, a reverse situation exactly do you have um any figures amy and maybe i'm missing it in the dashboard of uh renters by um uh say age or uh yeah i guess by age as far as the uh which ones uh who are what what's a profile of the renters versus owners there is not, but that would be very interesting in cases like these to see how many people are uh, renting and what is their age bracket. And I believe that I looked for mm. this specifically with the Census Bureau information that's available. And I'm sure that, that it's available somewhere. But it could I be for did a selected set it. like PUMS uh, data, Nick, you know what I'm, mm -hmm. I think I'm saying? Um, so the, it could be, it, it could be available, although not in the, uh, maybe in the zip code size, it might be, uh, some larger groups and only for selected groups around the country. Cool. Okay, great. So we've looked at some different situations, the Austin zip code, and then this, uh, one outside Chicago. So that's the study and it's on bestplaces.news or bestplaces.net. And it's in our news section. It's called most burden, most rent burden zip codes. So I guess right now I'd like to open it up to some questions that Nick might have. Uh, Nick said he had some questions, and he's our he's amongst the smartest of us. So I'm sure he'll have some he's interesting questions. One of the questions. top four smartest guys. <laughs> <laughs> what Is honor. it okay if I stop sharing my screen, or should we yes. keep it going? No, that's def that def sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. So, um, well, I have to admit, I, I had some questions initially that you did eventually uh, touch on a little bit, but maybe we can expand on some of them. The first pattern I noticed was quite obvious that, you know, the problem that clears is clearly, you know, central to university towns, uh, which resonated with me because I grew up in a bunch of university towns. Uh, I actually, Amy, went to college an hour east of Morgantown. Um, so I'm familiar with that area. I went to Frostburg State. So... Uh, that was a very low cost, by the way, rent burden type place. Uh, yeah. Although 
I didn't do a lot in Morgantown specifically, so I'm not familiar with that. I did a lot of beer drinking, but not not renting or talking much about housing. But, (laughs) um, you know, I'm just curious. I I was going to ask the question, do we expect this pattern for other college towns? And the answer seems to be basically a yes. Um, But so I want to sort of frame the question a little differently. I'm just wondering, like, can we expect, I mean, can we expect this to be the case for other college towns? Can we assume that the there's an outsized impact on college students because you have this natural dichotomy between costs and income with young students? Do you, you think we could expect to see that in a lot of places? Yes. And the Census Bureau actually ha- has conducted research on this very topic. And they have found that in areas with a population of 10,000 or more in a given metropolitan area that includes a wide variety of individuals who might be going to college. So it's not just, uh, it's not just a, a problem with younger students, but all students in a given area. The point being is that in these college towns or in these areas where a college campus is present and that institution might be a major economic driver that is stimulating the local economy, there is a higher population of impoverished people. So college kids, because they tend to be, you know, forgive forgive me for being crass, but poor, they are actually causing a much higher poverty rate that is driving up the overall number of people who are experiencing poverty. And I actually took a look at the list of of college towns that is affected by this high number of impoverished college kids and every single one of these zip codes that we've identified as being a college town made it on that list. So I think there is a direct correlation to what you are speaking of. And it's not as if the Census Bureau doesn't know. I think it's a it's a very widely widely uh, known phenomenon that, unfortunately, no one really cares about. Nobody really cares about the college kids. I mean, on the on their way to you know getting those high paid jobs and getting themselves out of poverty. That's kind of I think the underlying assumption that is made. You know, Amy, you, you hit on something. I was wondering. You know, that the, the college students are in poverty. It's a really sort of a temporary poverty, isn't it? Because you, as you just noted, they're on their way to well-paying jobs, presumably, uh, and hopefully they won't spend much of their life paying off the debt. But um, could you really say that they're in poverty? That like the way that maybe people are that really don't have the that aren't able to make the investment and have mom and dad. Uh, pay for their um, college education because really they could be going for years uh, with uh, the savings of the family paying for them. They could on the on the on the on the roles of the demographic roles they could be poor, but really everything's paid for and they're buying uh, they're driving a new car. I think that argument could be made prior to two thousand six. I think with kids who are going through college and graduating during these times of economic cycles of booms and busts and recessions, those who have a college degree aren't seeing that uh, return on their education because it's so competitive right now in the workforce that they are racking up student debt. They might not be getting that high paid jobs, but those high payer, higher paid jobs. A lot of millennials admittedly went back to live with their parents after they had graduated because there were no job openings uh, available during the Great Recession of 2008. And I think that we did start to see the economy recover. But I I believe that that has really set back the total number of college kids who have graduated and maybe have not been able to secure that higher paid position. And while college debt tends to stack up and it affects millions of people. I'm not so sure that we can even make that argument uh, without considering the possibility that because of our economic precarities, even if you do have a college degree, that does not guarantee a higher paid position once you graduate especially in areas that uh, don't necessarily have a high demand. And you hear about the 
uh, you hear about the uh, criticisms of getting a worthless degree, like a like a like an arts degree, yeah. and that the that's your fault for or not philosophy. To- I was a philosophy major. Yeah, <laughs> that's definitely worthless. Yeah, mm. and so I mean, critical thinking. I, I disagree, but I, you know, it's what you do with it afterwards, or what you yeah, do with true. your life afterwards. Yeah, I I agree as well. I think there's so many more people going to college and taking out student loans that the uh, the demand for college degrees and positions that require college degrees. Uh, isn't necessarily rendered useless altogether, but as they say, it's becoming the new high school diploma. Hmm. And I don't know if that also plays a, a role in the uh, the question as to whether or not your degree is paying off. Yeah, interesting discussion. I'm I'm I have seen it's a good discussion to be had. I still think it's good to go to college because you learn so much, and it's such a step up from what you get in high school and like it or not, I, I mean, honestly, like good luck getting a job, a good job without one. I, I think it's good to talk about, um, it's good to talk about what, what's my, what my return is and how much the, the debt is. But I, 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 I do worry. I hope I see like a lot of stuff like online where people are saying, Oh, don't get, don't go to college. It's a scam. <laughs> and I would, I would, I would worry about, about that lesson being taught to um, young people, because I still think it's good to go to college if you can. I, I'm not. I, I don't. I'm not saying a bunch of. I'm not saying two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand dollars of debt is a good thing to have. But I would, you know, like people are say, oh, I'll just be a Bitcoin trader, or I'll, <laughs> or I'll just do crypto and, you know, do- Dogecoin to the moon, and and I'll just be an influencer. But I. So there are, I think it's a good thing to be critical of what the college experience is and what it returns to the people that undertake it. But I still would want any of my friends or children or young people, my mentee, my mentees or whatever, I'd say still go to college. It's, it's a good thing. Yeah. I think that if uh, college were free, we would be uh, really addressing. Yeah. yeah. A lot of countries have college for the free. The issue head on. Yeah. Yeah. I think you mature so much in college. Uh, I think that's really uh, all, all has a lot to do with those those four years that you spend at a a, a college with other people, uh, learning how to get along with people, how to disagree with people, uh, how to make stupid mistakes and move on, and uh, you just grow so much as a person that goes on even outside the curriculum. So I, I think it's very important. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So that was a really good discussion. Thanks, Amy, for being our guest. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And once again, the study is most rent burden zip codes. That's on the bestplaces.net site in the news section. It's also on the homepage right now of bestplaces.net, so you can access it there. And you can also access Amy's Substack and tune into her Twitch channel if you have a data hankering and you want to uh, enter a community of people who are very supportive. And, and Amy, I, I will say that you've, with your chat, you've done a great job of dragging them along. I'm sure people were, some people were kind of interested in it, in it already, but I, I've seen your chat kind of, uh, even over the past five months, when I've dipped into your chat, there's some people that you have converted into being interested in the issues that you're talking about and uh, your bold uh, forays into these topics and is, is I think, doing some good out there because the level of the chat discourse and seeing people get interested in these topics is encouraging, especially on a platform such as Twitch, which is kind of a, a interesting platform as we've discussed. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, I don't know, Nick, uh, Bert, you have any closing statements or Amy too, if you have anything? No, I really appreciate you dropping by Amy and sharing your work and sharing your views on some of these they are very interesting and, and compelling. Thanks. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for, for coming in and, and having this conversation. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the visualizations. They're really nice. Thank you so much. Great. Cool. 
Great. Okay. So um, uh, this is a number, uh, another one of our series. Uh, we'll be back again soon with another podcast with the gang and talking about some new topics. Meanwhile, uh, check out bestplaces.net. We're doing new stuff all the time. And most of all, leave comments about where you live because we'd love to know what's happening and you can share with us our team, and then everyone else on Best Places about what's happening in your place, what you think about the livability there. We'd love to know because nobody knows like you do what's happening where you live. So you're the expert where you are, and it would be wonderful if you share it. So we'll see you next time. Check out bestplaces.net. And from Bertrand, Bert, Nick, and Al, and Amy, thanks very much for joining us. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.